In a previous episode of the dev series, we talked about the environment art and lighting in the Goliath offices, but that's only half the story when creating a location that feels engaging to explore. What really elevates a level is the thoughtful curation of enemy and item placement, as well as the subtle guidance of the player through that space. G'day, I'm Jordan from It's Got Stealth, and welcome to the Samurai Unicorn development series. In this episode, we'll be looking at the level design of the Goliath offices and the philosophies that guided the decisions we made while creating the opening mission for the game. Miyamoto and Ramiro both believe you should build your first level last. That way all the lessons learned over the course of development can be put on display in the opening moments. That makes a lot of sense to me, but unfortunately for Samurai Unicorn, we are making a narrative-driven experience where the future of the game is not always certain. So here we are, despite conventional wisdom, making our first level first, and hoping to deliver an experience that demonstrates everything that you can expect from the game going forward. To do that, we have some guiding principles that I believe are important to the overall design of Samurai Unicorn. The first is to be challenging but not frustrating, next is to guide the player without hand-holding, and finally, the game should always reinforce the story. With these three principles in mind, we set out to create the Goliath offices. Every level in Samurai Unicorn starts its life as a sketch on grid paper before being translated into 3D through either a simple block out in Unity using Pro Builder or the new modular level packs that Adam has been working on for the Vermin Hunts. Ultimately, placing the enemies and items becomes the moment where the majority of these early ideas are put into practice and the curation of the player's experience can really begin. When we are introduced to Chloe and Gabe, they have entered the Goliath offices in search of something that they believe will incriminate the company or at least explains Fox Pass's most recent attack. To help reinforce the narrative setup of Chloe being a detective, the Goliath officers, and most of the levels in the game, are constructed in a way that encourages full exploration of the location in hopes that players feel a more investigative mindset while navigating the level. This is most clearly demonstrated in the lead up to the first Vermin reveal, where the player is immediately presented with two paths and a tease of what they need to unlock to progress the story. If you head straight into the archives and then drop down into the kitchenette, you will get a more tense build up to the first vagrant waiting by the microwave that acts as the tutorial enemy. In this case, they have a reduced movement speed and can only do a basic swipe. This should provide a tense but easy encounter for players to practice their aiming. Because you have to drop into the kitchenette with no obvious way to get back up, the idea is that players who have found both keycards might see this as an opportunity to double back and search the storage room before continuing on. Doing so results in a slightly more difficult early encounter against 2-3 to three vagrants with their full speed and move sets, but with the reward of a shotgun and surplus of early items that will make the rest of the level significantly easier. For players who ignore the calls to investigate fully or decide to rush headlong into the first encounter, the assumption is that they are either going to have a much harder time and survive in a more scrappy manner or die quickly to the first lot of vagrants before the main combat challenge of the upper officers. In the event that players find the kitchenette and beyond too difficult without the shotgun, I hope the lack of checkpoints in this early build encourages them to explore more thoroughly before dropping down again or at the very least to quickly master efficiently dismembering vermin limbs to minimize wasting the limited ammo. When we were coming up with what sort of rooms should be in the level. One of the more obvious ones that we wanted to do was the cubicle office. This naturally led to an encounter that took advantage of the narrow paths between the cubicles to create blind spots and a sort of maze-like path through the room. What came from that is what I would describe as our first major challenge for players who are starting to get a feel for the combat. In the acquisitions office, you have to contend with a couple of patrolling vagrants hidden by the cubicle walls, as well as three vagrants scattered around the room waiting to ambush you from the dark when triggered. All this in a room where there are more opportunities to be flanked and your ability to safely back away while aiming is significantly reduced, which is a tactic I believe most players would have learned to employ on previous enemies. After players complete the loop of the lower offices and return to the main hall via the staircase, they will find themselves next to the storage room as a reminder to check for extra items before continuing on into the sealed lab airlock. None of this is ever explicitly stated in the game as objective markers or barks, but the looping design of the offices is there to remind players of areas they might have missed or forgotten before progressing the story. The high damage of enemies and relatively limited resources are also in place to encourage players to feel the need to really search the environment for any advantage they can get and in doing so become fully aware of their surroundings. In the Goliath offices there are a number of ambushes set up to encourage players to approach certain areas with heightened caution. Depending on your path through the opening section of the mission, your first experience with the more overt versions of these ambushes could be the vagrant hiding in the cabinet that bursts out in a jump scare moment or the one that emerges in the storage room to surprise you after you thought the coast was clear. On the surface, 
these are the same trick. A vagrant is hiding in a cabinet and the player activates them when walking into an unseen trigger. But to me they sow a seed of paranoia that might cause the player to treat every cabinet with suspicion, which feels like an important idea to convey early on. Even though we might not use the cabinet in the same way for future missions, there will be plenty of ambushes and I want players to be thinking about places vermin could be hiding in the same way that Chloe might be when investigating one of these dimly lit locations. Whenever we introduce a new vermin, the goal is to create a vignette that unfolds in gameplay and encapsulates the personality of the enemy. And that's the intent behind the last major hurdle of the upper offices. When players are finally able to open the sealed lab, they are met with the prowler feeding on another vermin that was left in the airlock with it. This is an extremely aggressive and significantly tougher vermin that can make quick work of Clo, so we made sure there is plenty of space to back up and allow players to take aim at the limbs, which are a little more difficult to hit due to the speed and low profile of the new enemy. Depending on how well you You've been doing so far, this could be a manageable escalation of the challenge or a real shock to the system. But either way, you're going to be properly tested when Chloe enters the lab and comes into possession of the parasitic gauntlet. With all of the game's base combat mechanics now in your control, we really start to ramp up the intensity of the encounters, as well as reducing the overall amount of ammo available in order to encourage the balanced use of the new unicorn abilities with the gunplay. While I would describe the majority of Samurai Unicorn's combat design philosophy as being quite open to the player in how they choose to tackle the challenge, thematically learning to rely on Unicorn is a big part of the story and it is the combination of both of their skills that makes Klo formidable enough to take on the Dream Eaters. So creating more and more dangerous scenarios that push you to mix and match these skills as early as this opening mission is a major goal. Of course you can still beat the tutorial sequence with Klo's guns, but it will drain your resources when using Unicorn would allow you to dispatch all the enemies more efficiently efficiently, and you'll leave the encounter with a fully recharged energy bar regardless. Assuming you have gotten used to the new unicorn melee system, it is time to face the last challenge of the Goliath officers, an exit exam style boss fight against Corpse Processor, the first of many Dream Eaters that Chloe and Unicorn will have to defeat. In Chloe's first run in with a Dream Eater, she has only just begun to understand her newly acquired unicorn abilities and her partnership with the Parasitic Gauntlet is tenuous at best, so by allowing players to use their guns and in the process waste ammo, I think that helps roll playing aspects of Chloe's character, she would still try to use her weapons reflexively. On the flip side, Corpse Processor is mostly resistant to firearms, but can also deflect bullets. So by allowing players to waste their ammo firing at him, I think it reinforces the danger Chloe has found herself in, and in doing so, makes the victory against the Dream Eater feel more meaningful within the narrative. But these are ultimately fun benefits of wanting to create a final challenge to wrap up the opening mission, that ensures players fully understand the benefit of using Unicorn's abilities. By making them 100% necessary to beat the Dream Eater, we can safely move on to our plans for the rest of the missions, knowing that anyone who gets past this point understands the power of deflecting attacks and recognizing when their shots are having no effect on an enemy. Of course, these are just the ideas behind the opening mission. And all the ideas of what makes a good level don't really mean much until people have actually played it, and you can see how well those plans translate to players who don't necessarily have an intimate knowledge of what you are trying to achieve. And this means you will most likely receive a lot of initial feedback that kind of runs opposite to your goals. The more you are willing to let players be taught by the experience of playing the game, the more you have to be open to the idea that people are not necessarily going to get it straight away, no matter how clear you think you have designed the encounters or level. But I think if you want to make a game that is true to itself and more likely to create an impression on a player, stepping back and processing that feedback with the guiding principles of your project is an incredibly valuable step to maintaining the soul of the game. Well that will do us for this episode of the Dev Series. If you'd like to support the project, please wishlist the game on Steam and consider subscribing to our Patreon or joining the Samurai Unicorn Discord community. Until next time, thanks for watching.